In 1864, four brothers from Jackson County, Indiana, Frank, John, Simeon, and William Reno, formed a gang that terrorized southern Indiana, Missouri, and Iowa until 1868. They stole from travelers, robbed post offices, businesses, and even courthouses. But in 1866, they found where the real money was. At Seymour, Indiana, they committed the first train robbery in U.S. history, and they knew they were onto something. They proceeded to rob four more trains during their career in crime, gaining not only currency and federal bonds, but gold, lots of gold. While they had time to buy fancy clothes and pose for a picture, they certainly didn't have time or ability to spend that much money. For over 150 years, treasure hunters have scoured southern Indiana. We just need to follow the trail of the Reno Gang. The tale of the lost Reno Gang treasure is a very dark one. It's about cold-hearted, lawless men that would do anything for easy money. And if anyone stood in their way, they were murdered. They were counterfeiters, arsonists, extortionists, and armed robbers, whose crimes were so prolific that stories of their exploits often sound made up. The Reno gang were not heroes, nor Robin Hoods of their day. They were cold-blooded killers. The Reno gang's story starts at Rockford, a small town north of Seymour, Indiana. Wilkeson and Julia Reno were married here in 1835 and started a farm. They had six children, and out of that bunch, four of them became outlaws. Frank and John began a life of crime by cheating people at card games. They were also suspected of horse theft. There were a string of suspicious fires where businesses burned to the ground. The Renos virtually burned all the citizens out of Rockford so they had the place to themselves. By the time the Civil War came around, signing up for service in the Union Army seemed like a good idea. The Reno brothers could get away from local people that were very tired of them doing whatever they wanted, seemingly above the law. But as their criminal minds reasoned, if they were paid each time they signed up, why not go to other places to sign up and get money? by using other names. They did this repeatedly, committing the crime of bounty jumping. But in 1864, their crimes turned more bold. Frank and two non-family gang members, Dixon and Grant Wilson, robbed the Jonesville, Indiana post office in Gilbert's store. All three men were later captured. However, Grant said he'd testify against Frank and Dixon, and he ended up murdered. Frank and Dixon were cleared of all crimes, though everyone knew they did it. People were scared. It was only the start of much bigger and more violent things to come. Not satisfied with robbing just individuals, the gang came up with a bold plan to rob a train with federal money. On October 6th, 1866, John and Sim, along with Frank Sparks, boarded a train at the Seymour, Indiana Depot. After overpowering a guard, they robbed one safe of $16,000. That's over $300,000 in today's money and was a huge amount for the Jackson County men. They then threw another safe off the train, but their accomplices couldn't open it and fled. Nonetheless, the gang made history 
as it was the first train robbery in United States history. A passenger named George Kinney identified the bandits. John and Sim Reno and Frank Sparks were then arrested and put behind bars. But just like the witness to the post office robbery, George was also murdered and the gang members were released without anyone willing to testify. During the course of the gang's activities, the Reno brothers attracted at least eight more gang members, making it a force to be reckoned with. But there's one thing they didn't count on. The safe they had robbed was insured. Therefore, the Pinkerton Detective Agency was assigned to track down and bring the gang to justice. The bandits had no idea what hornet's nest they had kicked. Alan Pinkerton established the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. In all practical respects, it was like the FBI or military counterintelligence is today. He even established an early database to collect information on criminals. He was very methodical and thorough. During the Civil War, he was a trusted advisor to President Lincoln. He established a spy network, one that could estimate Confederate troop numbers and future operations. He had his people everywhere, listening and infiltrating. For a fact, if Alan Pinkerton was after you, there was a very good chance you were going to be caught. And that started with John Reno. After the Davies County Courthouse was robbed in Missouri, Pinkerton agents identified and arrested him. He served 10 years at the Missouri State Penitentiary and was released in 1878. However, he was arrested and returned to prison in 1886, this time for counterfeiting. He was not released until 1889, but being in jail likely saved his life. Although they didn't know it, the Reno gang was living on borrowed time. They continued with three armed robberies in Iowa followed by a second Seymour, Indiana train heist in December of 1867. Yet a third train robbery was committed by six members of the gang. But this time, Pinkerton detectives were waiting and fended off the attack. Back in Iowa, the gang robbed the Harrison County Treasury. And the very next day, the Mills County Treasury Adjusted for inflation, the gang had stolen well over $1 million at this point. Gang members were arrested by the Pinkertons, but incredibly, they escaped and returned to Indiana. Many believed that the Reno gang bribed their way out of jail. While that was never proven, the growing sentiment was that the law wasn't going to stop them. On May 22, 1868, the gang committed its fourth train robbery near Marshfield, Indiana, and this time, the payday would be legendary. The express car contained currency, federal bonds, and a large sum of gold. They netted over $96,000, or a little over $2 million in today's money. The robbery made national news due to the amount of money and that they'd caught the Pinkertons totally off guard. Thinking ahead, the Reno gang had cut telegraph lines so authorities couldn't be contacted. Their accomplices were waiting with horses and swept off into the night like ghosts that were never there. But it would be the end of their luck. The Pinkertons had a reputation to uphold, and citizens were ready for action. 
On July 9th, 1868, the gang would attempt its fifth and final train heist. Unfortunately for them, there were 10 Pinkerton agents on the train. As soon as the bandits boarded, a gunfight began. Many were wounded, but all of them escaped, except for Volney Elliott, who identified the other bandits in exchange for leniency. At Rockford, the Pinkertons arrested Theodore Clifton and Charlie Roseberry. Ironically, they were put on a train and sent towards Seymour for sentencing. At what's now called Hangman Crossing, just outside Seymour, the train was stopped by armed vigilantes on July 10, 1868. Calling themselves the Jackson County Vigilance Committee, armed men boarded the train and took the three prisoners. They were then hanged on a nearby tree. Frank Sparks, John Moore, and Henry Jarrell were caught in Illinois by the Pinkertons. They too were sent to Seymour, Indiana for sentencing. But in a dark repeat of the first three prisoners, all three men were hanged on the very same tree. The Pinkertons captured William and Simeon in Indianapolis, but this time sent them to a jail at Lexington, Indiana. Suspecting more vigilante justice, the prisoners were moved to the jail at New Albany. The hunch was right. Soon after the prisoners were moved, the jail was attacked. However, it was far from over. Frank Reno and Charlie Anderson had fled to Canada, but were caught and sent to New Albany as well. On the night of December 11th, 1868, 65 hooded men assaulted the New Albany jail. They hung Frank, William, and Simeon Reno, as well as Charlie Anderson, inside the jail. It was the end of the Reno gang that had plundered and terrorized Indiana, Iowa, and Missouri citizens for four years. But in their passing was left many mysteries. Today, an empty PNC Bank building stands where the old jail once was. Passerbys have no idea that four people were once hanged there. Just east on a quiet neighborhood street is Reno Avenue. Standing as a reminder that a life of crime often has a violent and tragic end. A few blocks from the Seymour, Indiana train depot, where the Reno brothers launched their first train robbery, is City Cemetery. Here lie the Reno brothers, Frank, William, and Simeon. All three of them have the same date of death, the night they were hung. The question that remains, where did over three million dollars go after they died? A portrait of the gang, wearing fancy clothes, is the only evidence that they spent any of the money that they stole. As criminals, buying anything large would have brought unwanted attention. While never proven, they were suspected of bribing corrupt local officials to escape prosecution on at least three occasions. But it's very unlikely that they spent all the money on bribes. In a day where five dollars would buy an acre of land, a few thousand dollars would be enough for many to look the other way. It was once very common to bury money and valuables on your land. It's known that the Renos had used some of their money to buy land in Jackson County. They did return to their father's farm at Rockford between robberies. We might suspect that they buried their loot there, but hiding your money where people expect it to be is a bad idea. The Renos were smarter than that. Out of 12 known 
Reno gang members, only two survived. A man known only as Dixon was arrested early in the gang's career, but never mentioned again. It's presumed that he left a life of crime after that incident. The last living gang member was John Reno. Sent to prison in 1868, he narrowly avoided the lynchings that killed his brothers. He died of natural causes in 1895, but neither he, his brother Clinton, or sister Laura were ever known to have money. In fact, just the opposite was true. It's not likely that they had or knew where the treasure was. It must be somewhere else. Looking at a map of where the Indiana train robberies occurred, they all centered in Jackson and Scott counties. Staying around these counties with stolen loot would be a very bad idea. They'd want to hide it, far enough from the crime scene, but not too far to have access. Somewhere safe. Due south of Jackson County is Cave Country. This area has the largest concentration of caves in the entire state. There are over 2,000 documented caves in the region, and the largest cave system, the Binkley Cave System, has over 44 miles of passages and counting. There are definitely places to hide things. If a person wanted easy access by boat, there are caves all along the Ohio River. And better yet, it flows down to the Mississippi River and arrives at New Orleans. And there are caves along the way. There are ones above the White and Wabash Rivers. But only one cave has ever been associated with the Reno Gang, Little Goss Cave in Floyd County. It has three levels. The top is like an overlook. The middle scene here is big enough for horses. And the lower level is said to be very deep. But most curiously are symbols carved in the front of the cave. Many think that these are clues left by the Reno Gang, while others think they were made by Native Americans. And a third faction think they were made by kids for something to do in summers past. No treasure has ever been found at Little Goss Cave. It's intriguing to think that Alan Pinkerton, the greatest detective of his time, could never find the Reno treasure. And in over 150 plus years, no one has ever claimed to have found it. But if you found gold in a cave or digging in your backyard, would you tell anyone? There have been stories of people finding gold pieces along the White River. Tales of people that knew the Renos and where they hid after robberies. But perhaps the most captivating story happened in 2023 across the river from Indiana. A man found over 700 gold coins buried in a Kentucky cornfield. Was it something hidden during the Civil War? Or has the Reno treasure finally been found? The uncertainty of a legend keeps our imaginations alive. It activates that part of our brain from childhood, where adventure is real and the glory of discovery makes the journey worthwhile. And just maybe, that's the real treasure, after all.